technical uh, intelligence field, and I think uh, what you're going to hear from her is going to be uh, a little uh, enlightening for you in terms of how we address uncertainty and how we think about things that are not necessarily as specific as um, this is the exploit the adversary used, uh, things that are a little bit more mm, abstract, if you will. And I know she didn't want me to use that word, but I did anyway. So, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Ruth Dyer. Hi, everyone. I'm glad you stuck around. Um, I know being the last few presentations of the day, we're only going to get about half the audience. Uh, my name is Ruth Kadair. I am a traditional intelligence analyst. I've been working in the cyber realm for a couple of years now, but before that, I spent about 10 years focused on the Middle East. Um, and so that, that's my background. Um, there were some key ideas in the first day that I really want to recap before we get into this presentation because these key ideas are really important to understanding the tradecraft that we're going to talk about later on. So blind spots. There were a number of people who talked about blind spots and understanding the blind spots or the gaps in your data and what those blind spots are and how to account for them or compensate for them. But also context. Context is key and without context intelligence has little to no value. And then on top of that assumptions and conclusions. So don't make assumptions and don't jump to conclusions. Those were two very key ideas from yesterday. And then there are two key quotes from yesterday as well. Um, Rick Holland said, clearly it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray in our space. And I think um, one of the challenges is to convey the gray content in a way that is clearly gray and not either black or white. And then Michael Wilburn said, I don't think that word means what you think it means. And <laughs> I want you to keep that in mind anytime you're reading an intelligence product because there's a lot of intelligence products that use words in ways they were never meant to be used. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about how to apply traditional tradecraft to the cyber intelligence world. And there were a lot of talks yesterday about how do you find quality intelligence and how do you figure out is this intelligence relevant for me? And so this talk is going to give you the skills to go through the intelligence and decide if it's relevant to you and decide if it's quality. It's also going to give you the skills to produce quality intelligence if that's something that you do. So the last presentation, um, Kyle and Scott talked a lot about um, three types of reports. They got to the very end and they talked about um, the RFI, the short report, and the long report. And so this is going to give you some skills for when you read those reports, how do you figure out if the analysis was good or if the analysis has some holes in it? So Colin Powell had three rules for his intelligence team. He said, tell me what you know, tell me what you don't know, tell me what you think, and make sure you always tell me which is which. So tell me what you know is your data. This is, these are the things that you, can, you, have, you have logs for, you have data for. Tell me what you don't know are your gaps or your blind spots. And then tell me what you think is your assessment or your analysis. And you have to, you have to make sure that you're not feeling embarrassed or trying to hide the things you don't know. The fact that you don't know something isn't bad. It's not something to be ashamed of, it's not something to hide, and trying to hide it will only make your assessment worse. So what's the difference between data and assessment? Um, I think someone talked about the difference between data and intelligence earlier. I want to go into a little bit more detail about the difference between them. Data is black and white, assessment is gray. Assessment is very fuzzy, and data is precise. And so you never want to confuse the two when you're talking to, when you're writing a report or when you're reading a report. If you can't figure out what is data and what is assessment in a report, that's a sign that the report has issues. So um, traditional intelligence deals with their blind spots in certain ways. Here's some examples of blind spots from World War II. Sorry, the last slide was supposed to have been hidden, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to use World War II as an example because this is when traditional intelligence really formalized their tradecraft and when most of the intelligence disciplines came into being in the, the form that they are today. So there were a lot of radio intercepts in World War II, and the radio intercepts were fantastic intelligence. You could tell what people, orders people were giving to their various units around Europe. The problem was you couldn't tell what orders were being passed through means other than signals. You also couldn't tell what was being sent over encrypted channels, and you couldn't tell um, what was misdirection. If they were sending orders over the radio that were clearly intended to not be followed, you, you had no idea. And then aerial imagery was fantastic. Aerial imagery came into its own in World War II. But aerial imagery only shows you what's on the ground at the time of the image. So if you take your image at 11 o'clock and all the interesting activity happens at 2 o'clock, 
your aerial imagery is completely useless and you'll never see that activity because it's a blind spot for aerial imagery. Informants and spies are very useful and World War II made great use of this type of uh, intelligence collection. But if all of the interesting activity is happening in Department A of the enemy command and all of your spies are in Department C, you're still blind. You have fantastic intelligence on what Department C is doing, but Department C isn't where the intelligence is. And so that's a blind spot. And then there's a lot of media and propaganda that took place in World War II. And this, a lot of this media was actually created intentionally to mislead the adversary rather than to inform the public. And so these are the blind spots within traditional intelligence. And you can take that through to the, the next 70 or 80 years and, and as the intelligence services, uh, tr what do you call them, disciplines became more sophisticated, um, they've worked out ways around most of these blind spots. Um, but they still exist today. So these are some of my favorite <laughs> examples from World War II. We have the Enigma machine, which at the beginning of the war, it was Germany's advantage because the Allies couldn't read what Germany was saying to their nefarious units and outposts. But by the end of the war, it was to the Allied advantage because the Allies could read all the intercepts, but the Germans didn't know it. So that, that's an example of a blind spot on both sides. Um, the, I, the, the tank on the bottom is a decoy. It's inflatable. That's why four people are holding it up off the ground with their pinkies. Um, so <laughs> there were a number of these decoys used um, in North England to convince the Germans that Operation D-Day would happen in the North rather than in the South. And it was very successful. Hitler totally believed it and it's one of the reasons D-Day was successful. It totally spoofed the aerial imagery and the human, uh, the human informants. And then this ID card is my favorite one. This is Operation Mincemeat. The body of a dead homeless man in England was given a fake identity, complete with everything. His, his fake identity had a house, a family, a girlfriend, like the whole, everything you could imagine. They put it all in this, uh, they made him into, I think, a naval petty officer or maybe a commander or something like that. Um, gave him a uniform, put all of his pocket litter and all that good stuff on him, and dropped his body off the coast of Italy with a bunch of fake documents to convince the Axis that England was planning on, uh, I think it was something with their operations in the Mediterranean. Those documents made it all the way to Hitler's desk. They were completely fake and nothing about any of the information was true. Hitler totally believed it and it absolutely gave the Allies an advantage. So these are some very serious blind spots within traditional intelligence. Um, and traditional intelligence is aware of these blind spots. Uh, so the way to deal with these blind spots within traditional tradecraft is to use multiple intelligence sources. So if you can get signals and imagery of something, you've got a lot fewer blind spots because they don't have the same uncertainties. Um, and if you can't do multi-intelligence, you can do multi-source. So you can get different types of images of the same thing or different images from different days, different times of day, things like that. And then the other thing is to call out the sources and the level of uncertainty. Because if people understand what your level of uncertainty is, then they know if they should take this data seriously or not seriously. And when they aggregate the data, they can aggregate the uncertainty to figure out is this good intelligence or bad intelligence. And that's important because bad analysis is bad defense, is bad policy, and is very bad press. So on the, the, the network side, you can avoid blind spots by multi-sourcing with like host and network information or collaborating with various different companies um, to, to gather more information on what's going on um, around you. Cyber intelligence is the newest int. And as Rick Holland said yesterday, we're still figuring out our tradecraft. We still don't know exactly how we want to do things. So something that's really important for us to understand is cyber intelligence combines many types of intelligence into cyber and then says, oh, hey, look, it's multi-int. But that's not actually the case. So we have to be careful with that. Because cyber intelligence has blind spots. Cyber, the, the technical analysis, the data can tell you when the incident happened. It can tell you what the incident was. It can tell you how they accomplished the incident. But it can only tell you where the incident hit your network from. So where did the incident originate from? You may or may not be able to tell depending on what type of incident this is. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty around who. Who did the incident? How do you know? Who was behind the keyboard? you're probably not going to know who was behind the keyboard unless you capture the webcam on while they're hands-on keyboard. Um, but you might know what usernames or email addresses were involved in the incident. So there's uncertainty around that, that part of the, the data. Why they did this. 
That's a really difficult one to answer, and I'll go into that on the next slide. Where, sometimes where is very uncertain, because if there's multiple hot points, if there's a lot of spoofing going on, the origination of the incident could be impossible to find with your data available. And then when, if the recon started off your network, it, there's a lot of social media that, that goes on in terms of um, APT using social media to start their recon before they hit your network. So if all the recon on this incident happens off your network, you have no idea when they first started targeting you. And that's an important piece of information because if you know when they first started targeting you, you might be able to figure out what triggered them to look at you. And so this is a, another source of uncertainty that we can't tell with the data we have available. Intent is the ultimate source of uncertainty. You can never actually know for sure what is going on in the mind of another person. Anyone who says they know exactly why this happened is selling something. There's absolutely, <laughs> there's absolutely no way to know for sure. Anybody who says that this is why something happened should qualify that statement in order for you to understand how much data they have to back that statement up. So it's possible to make guesses at why they, someone did this. It's possible to make very educated guesses, but you can't ever make a declarative statement about why something happened. So managing uncertainty is, is the whole point of, of this presentation. So you've got uncertainty in your data, you've got uncertainty in your analysis, and your final product has this overall level of uncertainty. And the purpose of of managing your uncertainty is to tell the reader in the product how much you don't know and how much uncertainty you have eliminated. So that's a lot of talking about things you don't know and can't quantify. But it's really important to do so that the reader can assess how much confidence they should put in their final assessment that you give them in this report. And when you're reading a report, you should be looking for this type of information to tell you how much confidence you should have in the final conclusion. And this is all managed through clear communication, specifically estimate of words. So these are my favorite estimate of words. These are very um, intelligence community centric estimate of words. But as you'll see in some of my examples, um, these are not the only estimate of words out there. I sat down with Mike a few months ago to, to start thinking about this presentation. In about 20 minutes, I came up with more than 100 estimate of words. Um, and that was just a quick, off the top of my head, guess. So there's a lot of different ways to talk about uncertainty. These are some very, very easy to find ones. Um, the first group talks about how solid is your data, and the second group talks about how sure are you that your analysis is correct. And there's a lot more groups out there, and there's a lot of ways to discuss this. So this is uh, a, a bit more definition in terms of the, the confidence words, high, medium, and low. And Mike's going to go into more about this in his, his presentation coming up next. Um, so high confidence, you're really pretty sure this is the one. Medium confidence, you're 50-50, could go either way. And low confidence, pretty much anything could knock you off this, this uh, theory. Um, so if we put them all together, I could say that I assess with low confidence that Dory from Finding Nemo was possibly only pretending to have memory loss in order to spend more time with Nemo's father, Marlin. <laughs> and you would understand that I'm not very sure about this theory, and I give it a 50-50 shot that this is the, from the movie I have evidence for any of this idea in the first place. Um, and so this, these are some examples. I've tried to color code them so you can kind of get an idea. Um, I really like the top one as well. I assess with high confidence that unconfirmed reports of UFOs will happen next month. Um, these things happen every month, so I can pretty, be pretty confident that it's going to happen, and the reports are always unconfirmed, so <laughs> um, that's, that's a pretty easy statement to make. And this is, this is very um, traditional tradecraft format in terms of the, uh, the wording and the structure. And you don't have to stick to this format, and my examples are not in this format. Um, this is just, I, I found some really funny things to say, so I said them. Um, so when should you use estimate of language? When you're talking about your data, you should rarely use estimate of language. Instead, you should cite your data. You should be able to make fairly objective statements about your data, and so you should just make the statement and cite your data. But you should always use estimate of language when you're talking about your assessment. So I have log data that says this. 
cite your data. I think that log data means that the adversary did X on my network. That's an assessment. It should have estimate of language on, around it. And so anytime you're talking about what your data means or why you think your data does or doesn't mean something, you should be using estimate of language to tell your reader how sure you are and how much data you have to back up your conclusion. And Mike will go into how to figure out how much data you have in the next presentation. So in real life, we have our intelligence rules, and we're reading this report. And we're looking for words that disguise poor analysis. We're looking for non sequitur statements, random statements of fact that don't fit with anything else in the paragraphs before or after. We're looking for the echo chamber effect. This is when someone puts out a very poorly researched and, and um, supported report. A couple other people produce some spin-off reports from that. Now all of a sudden you've got a whole lot of reports that hide the flaws in the original source. And you're like, oh man, there's a lot of people talking about this. The last person to talk about it is pretty reputable. I'm guessing this is a good theory. And it totally hides the flaws in the original report. So that's a very important one to look out for. And the uncertainty should shrink when you're reading a report, not grow. So this is, this is really important. This is the key takeaway. When you get to the end of a report, if you have more questions than answers, if you have more questions than when you started, it's probably not a good report. And so this is why at LM Cert, we don't actually have any automated external intelligence feeds. We only have automated external data feeds because we don't want our intelligence to go automatically into the system, we want to look at it and decide, is this valuable or not? Is this well sourced? Is this analysis done properly? Am I putting garbage into my system or am I putting good intelligence into my system? And so that's, that's something that we, when we're reading reports, we're looking for these things and we're looking for the good solid analysis before we take the indicators and do anything with them. So here's my example, my first example. Um, this is a report on Sands Casino that came out in Bloomberg in, I want to say, early, Janu early December of last year. And it's a fantastic report. It's quite lengthy. And it talks about um, unconfirmed anonymous reports that Iran was behind the Sands Casino data destruction attack. And so the statement goes, other countries have spied on American companies, and they have stolen from them, but this is likely the first time occurring months before the late November attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment that a foreign player simply sought to destroy American corporate infrastructure on such a scale. So I've underlined the estimate of words, but there's also a lot of qualification in there. They qualify the foreign player, meaning it's not a criminal action. They, f they qualify American corporate infrastructure, and they qualify the scale and they qualify the timeline. So there's a lot of information in here that they're, they're very clearly delineating. This statement can't be confused with a bunch of other more generalized statements. But they're also telling you they don't know for sure because it's very possible that this could have happened before and got completely covered up. It's also completely possible that this isn't Iran because they don't have any officials at Sands Casino and they don't have any officials in the US government to confirm that. So they're not going completely based off of these anonymous reports that don't want to be named. And, and that, that's not enough certainty to confirm in this report. The estimate of language provides the reader with an assessment of how solid this statement is. So if you read this statement and you come away 100% convinced that Iran did it, you need to read it again. But if you read this statement and you come away convinced that Iran probably did this and it's probably a big deal, but it's not the end of the world, then you're probably reading it about right. Um, so this is my other example. Um, I read the Operation Cleaver report. I was really excited. I was really hoping I was going to get a lot of good things out of it. Unfortunately, um, there were some analytical issues with the report. And so they're, connect they're connecting the Operation Cleaver activity to the IRGC was a major concern of mine. Um, they don't provide any data. In the beginning, they present the IRGC logo on a page with no connection to the text. Like 45 pages later, <laughs> they say in the conclusion that IRGC um, conducts malicious activity out of Iran, but they don't tie the IRGC to any of the activity in the report. And then after that, like 15 pages later, it's a very long report, um, 
They state that the IRGC logo inspired the Operation Cleaver logo because the, of the close connection between the Operation Cleaver activity and the IRGC. Well, I'm at the end of the report, and I haven't seen any indications of this. <laughs> so I have to wonder, are they making it up, or are they hiding their data? But I also have to wonder, how, do, like, how confident are they? Because they didn't tell me. At no point in time did they throw this in their speculation page. They didn't throw this in their assumptions page. They didn't put any estimate of language around this. I have no idea. I don't think the IRGC is connected to this activity simply because of the way they documented it in the report. If they had more of more firm connection, they probably would have told me um, in the report somewhere. So this is an example of analytical tradecraft done wrong. <laughs> There's other, <laughs> there's other examples from the report that I can talk about later if anybody's interested. Um, I have a whole soapbox on that thing. Uh, so in conclusion, you should clearly mark the unknowns in your data and talk about the level of uncertainty. You should not make analytical leaps or jump to conclusions, as has been stated earlier in this conference. And the payoff is higher quality of intel and better defended networks. So I can take questions and or have discussion questions, whichever people would prefer. So questions? Plenty of questions. Good. <laughs> how, do you, how do you balance a uh, well-polished report with the amount of time that you have to put it out? So you have raw data that with some indicators, but it's, you have maybe low or medium uncertainty. Um, but you don't want to also put out a report that's not going to be taken seriously because you don't have all the facts yet. So I think, I think this is a really hard thing to balance. You have to look at the goals of your organization and the goals of publication. What are you trying to gain out of publicizing this data? If you're, publicizing it in, if you're publishing it internally, then you want to put all of your confidence language in there and you want to say this is really preliminary we don't know. If you're doing collaboration with other, co with other companies in your industry, you again want to put it out with all of your confidence language and say this is really preliminary. We're hoping other people can fill in the blanks. And if you're publishing it on a blog, um, you probably don't have enough to publish or you have to publish it as this is really preliminary. We're hoping other readers or other analysts can fill in the blanks or this is our preliminary look at it. We're going to come out with a more solid report um, in the next weeks or months. Um, if you put out uncertain analysis as a confident statement that this is what is, you're going to look even worse if you have to go back and change it later. Um, so it's better to, to be clear up front with how confident you are and how much you can actually prove. Um, I talk to people all the time and I'm like, hey, I saw this random indicator. I thought it was really interesting. I have no idea what it means. Um, and because I'm really upfront with that, when they figure out what it means, they'll come back and tell me and now I've just collected intelligence. Um, so <laughs> uh, that, that's a kind of a useful, if, if you're really upfront with how much you do and don't know, you're more likely to be taken seriously. Um, and adding in some confidence words doesn't take that much extra time. You know, let it sit for an hour, go back and reread it and add in some probable, possible, um, likely, less likely, and, and then ship it off. Um, so that's, that's really what we, we do a lot of. So how do you distinguish between estimative words and weasel words? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, mostly I look for is the estimate, when I finish reading this paragraph or this report, do I have more questions or do I have fewer questions? If the estimative words are used correctly, I should have fewer questions. If they are weasel words, it should look like someone trying to sell me something or someone trying to get out of answering a question. And so I, it's more a matter of, it's a very subjective analysis, and you have to look at what is the tone and what is the, what is the overall impression created by this report. Um, if it looks like they're trying to sell you something, they probably are. Um, yes? Um, so did I understand correctly, you don't accept intelligence coming externally? And if any of that does come externally, do you provide some confidence rating to the specific reporter? Um, so if, when, when LM Cert, when we get external intelligence, we review it before we stick it into our system. Um, and so our, our analysts look at it and say, does this match what we know? Does this make sense? Is there giant gaping holes in the analysis? Um, 
if it, if it doesn't pass the smell test, then we just don't put it in our system. Um, we don't really provide it with a confidence rating, uh, but we, like, we just don't stick it in our system. Um, yep. Do you have uh, any occurrence where you use cover sheets that, uh, that state confidence level, reliability, and applicability uh, uh, of the report for internal reporting? Or what happens when you get those? Because different people have academic writing styles, uh, passive writing styles, things like that. And it's very difficult to filter that out. Sometimes it's better just to upfront state. So if we ever got something with a cover sheet, we would be thrilled. Um, we generally account for the writing style by, um, well, we have academic writers in our team. So we're used to um, um, adjusting for that different style, um, communication style. And um, if we got something with a cover sheet, we would probably up our confidence level in the report just based on the fact that they were giving us their assumptions up front. Um, we don't create cover sheets, but we will sometimes provide an overview for senior executives if they're, hey, how's this report? What do you think of it? Um, that's, it's not a very formal process that we do. It's, it's more like this is analysis. Go look at the report, um, if that makes sense. Um, we do, but we still don't automatically feed their intelligence into our system. It's what? Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, um, it, do, we, do we trust a source more because of their history and they have a history of, of well-sourced reports versus bad reports? Um, and, and the answer is we do trust certain sources more than others, but it's not, um, it's not formalized and it's not... Um, yeah, it, it, there's there's no structure to it, um, so that's that's that. Um, how am I doing on time? I have ten minutes. All right, can we go? To, will this work? No. Can we go to the discussion questions? All right. So I have a question for you guys. Um, do you guys consider indicator lists or IP lists to be threat intelligence? And if so, how do you judge the quality of those? Do you judge it based on the source, based on um, the content? Like, if there's no context, how do you how do you how do you rate those? So we have some questions and answers in the back. <laughs> so we, I, I think that was the purpose of the question I was asking earlier. Is we get a lot of that straight blacklist. We're telling you it's bad. Trust us. And they put 8.8.8.8 inside of it. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, so what we do is we we have two different ratings: a rating on the source, how well uh, we have seen them report in the past, and then a rating on the information we're receiving, as to you know does it make sense that the information in the context that is given means something? Straight straight list of IPs. No, we we normally just throw away. Right, and, and we don't consider them to be intelligence. We consider them to be indicator lists. Um, if they come from a source we trust, we'll kind of scan through them and see if they have value. But, I mean, we get a lot of lists of indicators that we record that we got this list, but we can't do anything with it because there's no context. So it, this, is a, this is a question that I noticed in the conference is, does that count as cyber intel? You do state that you record those kind of things in a system. What kind of system is that? Is that homebrew or is that an, an It's it's a homebrewed system where we um, we record the analysis that we did, the actions that we took. It's um, it's basically a ticket system, um, and you just stick your your comments below the last person's comments on that particular issue or indicator. Um, so it's searchable, so we can keep track of everything that we've done. We've got years and years of data built into the system, so we can see, oh, hey, someone sent this IP with absolutely no context. We didn't know what to do with it, now we do. So we keep track of things like that, but we don't necessarily act on them until we understand the value of the, the context. So there's a question back there. Actually, a comment. So how do you validate the confidence? Do you use secondary resources? 
do you uh, look at the data itself? Yeah, I'm, I'm asking you because uh, we've been through this and I want to see what other people have done. Oh, uh, you were mentioning the actual confidence uh, capabilities. Are you choosing that in isolation? Are you actually comparing against others? As an example, uh, we found that certain, well, we actually exercised and found that certain feeds actually pull off other feeds after an X amount of time period. And we found that if a bad piece of data gets shoved into one of the initial feeds, it runs the whole gamut all the way up. So how do you actually deal with the confidence? How are you dealing with the confidence level on that? Okay, do you actually put a probability rating on it or do you just use high, medium, low? You can make money doing workshops for vendors on how, because I see all these threat <laughs> intel reports like you do too, and I just want to face palm and be, I mean, <laughs> in, in submission, just some of, some of the things you said you could expand on, you could moonlight, make thousands and thousands of dollars every week just from doing, <laughs> because every vendor I work with, every, you got to have a report, and everyone's coming up, and those that don't have them have to do it. I think they should listen to your talk. I don't know. It's good. It's great. It, it, it solves a big challenge that I have as an analyst, and that all my customers have, because they're all chasing these reports, and everyone's trying to to ingest the indicators on them and spending all this time managing them, trying to correlate the threat actor names. So, it, you know, it goes back to the marketing component that we were talking about a little bit before and try to balance in the marketing perspective of this stuff. I said a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you always have questions. There it is. Um, can you comment, uh, in, in your opinion, on the, the feasibility? So we were talking about, you know, this data and how do we um, can we uh, programmatically, I think was the word, the word used, uh, assign confidence uh, to this data as it's being ingested. Can you comment on your feelings on the feasibility of that um, based on you know, what uh, we've seen about CTI, uh, threat intel feeds and things like that? Uh, what are your thoughts on whether or not that's something that's going to be feasible in the long term? So I think this goes back to the data versus assessment slide. And Alex Pinto had a great presentation on looking at the data as a data scientist. And I mostly focus on the assessment side of the intelligence spectrum. And I gotta be honest, data without, uh, someone, I had this on my first slide, someone said this yesterday, um, indicators without context are not intelligence. Or vulnerabilities without context are not valuable. Something like that. Um, and so data without context, in my opinion, is not intelligence. This is just data. If you have a list of indicators, this is just data. If you provide a context and you say, this indicator list is bad, well, that's not valuable context because who is it bad for? Is it bad for everyone in the whole world? Is it bad for people in China? Is it bad for people in Germany? Is it bad for people in a certain industry? Is it bad for people who run certain systems or have certain hardware? There's, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of assessment that needs to go into this data is bad. And so I don't consider indicator lists to be intelligence because there was no assessment done. And if there was assessment done, it's not provided to you. And so why do you think this indicator list is bad? What is your reasoning? What, it, what, were you, what are you using to back up your, your, assess, your assertion that this is a bad indicator list? If all you're telling me is this is bad, it's based on my reputation. Um, sorry, no. <laughs> I don't consider that intelligence. That's argument from authority, and that's a fallacy. So <laughs> um, <laughs> if, you can't, if you can't sit down and explain why each indicator or why each group of indicators is bad, you haven't provided me with intelligence. You've provided me with data. 
you're expecting me to do the assessment and the analysis, uh, which is fine if that was the intent, but you should state up front, hey, these are bad indicators, go do your own research. So that's my answer to your question. <laughs> um, and then we have a question or comment in the back here. Kay. Go ahead. Oh, uh, one other indicator is uh, the type of data. Is it a short, a medium, or long-term play? Uh, there have been long-term protocols that have been uh, used for uh, compromise, well-known compromises since 2001. Those aren't on the list anymore because people have expired them out. But we also, also have monthly ones, and we have within a few seconds. But there's no context. You got to have context. And then we have a question in the back here. address, okay, I can look at what net block that it is, and what's it associated with, and I can pull metadata, okay, off of parallel or nears or near offs, and statistically I could say, you know, I've, I've got within one standard deviation, okay, this particular IP address has hit nine times in the last 30 days, prior to that it only hit once, you know, in, in three months. So the fact that it's popping, okay, and it's popping from multiple sources, I can just report that Okay, mm -hmm. and that we're opening, it, you know, we're opening it up to look at it further because it's not normal behavior when something like that. So just, just when an IP address comes in, okay, it's kind of like the to us, it's the analyst's role to say, get the context. Okay, the other thing is, is like, yeah, we believe the reports are a real pain in the neck for us when we come in there. So this is, this is my concern about in threat intelligence reports. In the journalism industry, AP and Reuters do like 90% of the reporting and then everybody else just copies the reports. And my concern is that the cyber threat intelligence industry will end up doing that. Because if you look at the source of like 90% of the reports on the internet, they're AP, um, AFP, or Reuters. It's ridiculous. All those three sources provide the majority of your news reporting. So my concern is that that will, same thing will happen to threat intelligence. And hopefully, we can all keep producing positive, good, reliable intelligence and prevent that from happening. So I think I'm out of time. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, Rob Lee here again. I'm going to introduce uh, Mike uh, right before his uh, next talk. Um, Mike, you are speaking next, right? I just didn't jump in here. I hope you are. Um, I first met Mike Kloppert at the first SANS Digital Forensics and Internet Response Summit. I, I don't think we met prior to that point. We knew of each other. We took the class, but we knew of each other, and you know, you took a, my class a, a long time ago. But I remember Mike specifically at this event because I, re I remember getting a panel together and Mike's talk uh, was one of these talks that literally had, you know, everyone initially sitting back, it's kind of the end of day just like this one here. And then all of a sudden everyone just suddenly leaned forward. Now the, the title of this talk, do you remember, do you remember